The great German philosopher Martin Heidegger once said that the things that are most difficult to think about are the things that are most familiar to us. This applies very well to the topic of uh, my talk today, because what I want you to do is reconsider money. So money is something that we all use every day. We use it to buy coffee, we use it to get paid for work, uh, we use it to pay our bills, and most of the time, we tend to take it for granted. Sometimes we may think about money. If we have no money or little money, we may worry about how to get some money. And we, if we have enough money, or even too much money, we may contemplate how to spend our money. However, in this familiarity with money, a very crucial question tends to uh, get lost. And it is the question, how is money created? In order to understand the economy, and in order to understand money in the economy, we need to start understanding that in our economy, we have two kinds of money. We have paper money, and we have electronic money, which is the kind of money we use when we uh, use this uh, kind of device, uh, a payment card. If we think of money in terms of our daily use, there doesn't seem to be much difference between the two kinds of money. They are denominated in the same currency. If you buy a cup of coffee, it costs the same, regardless of whether you pay with this one or this one. So the difference between the two seems to be merely a matter of convenience. If, however, we ask this question, how is money created? we see that there is indeed a crucial difference between the two kinds of money. Let's start with the easy one, this one. Paper money. Paper money is created by the central bank. We can read that on the bank note. Uh, if anyone else tries to create this kind of money, and if they get found out, they will go to jail for counterfeiting. Electronic money, however, is a little trickier. The accounts that we have in our banks are called deposit account. And that made sound as if, ah, okay, so this kind of money is just this kind of money deposited in the bank. And in principle, that could be the case. It is, however, very misleading in terms of understanding how money works in the economy. Because electronic money is created by commercial banks when they issue new loans. So how does this work? How do Commercial banks create money. So imagine that I go into a bank and I get a loan of one million kroner. This loan will rarely be paid out in cash. So what really happens? Well, two things happen. The bank issues the loan and thereby records that now I owe the bank one million kroner. At the same time, they then credit my deposit account which means that now the bank owes me one million kroner. The trick here is, however, that this account money can be used as money. In other words, it is money. So when I start spending my uh, million kroner, I merely transfer money from my account in my bank to someone else's account in his or her bank. And in this process, the electronic money is not somehow transferred into uh, paper money and then transferred back into electronic money. So essentially what happens when banks issue a loan of, say, one million kroner, they create one million kroner worth of new money. They simply add this to the total supply of money in the economy. So we've learned that we have two kinds of money. Paper money, created by the central bank, and electronic account money, created by commercial banks. If we look at the total money supply in Denmark or United Kingdom or the Eurozone or uh, comparable economies, we see a similar pattern, which is that paper money makes up about 5% of the total uh, money in circulation, whereas this kind of electronic account money makes up 95% of the total money supply. And that's not even counting the money that are stashed away in the Cayman Islands or elsewhere. So when we get excited about all these new ways of smart ways of paying for things, not only with uh, plastic cards, but 
internet banking and smartphones, we have to remember that the price that we've paid for this convenience is that we have essentially privatized the creation of money in our society. So is this a problem? And if it is, why is it a problem? I believe that it is a problem, and I'm going to tell you why. The problem is not that banks are evil or bankers are greedy. The problem is that banks are banks. So this means that they are governed by certain incentives, which makes them create money in a way that is not always, you could even say rarely, in line with the overall needs of the economy. This has at least three very negative consequences. It creates inequality, uh, it, it, it creates instability, it creates inequality, and it creates a concentration of power. So let's take the first one, instability. Banks' willingness to create new money and lend it into the, the economy depends on the overall cycles in the economy. So when the economy is booming, house prices are going up, stock prices are rising, the banks are very keen to create new money and lend it into the economy. This, however, has the effect of inflating the prices in the economy even more. So house prices go up even further, and stock prices go up even further. And then we have bubbles, and as we know, ultimately these bubbles are going to burst, and we will have a crisis as the one we saw in 2008, and as all of the crises we've seen over the last four decades with regular intervals. And when these crises happen, the banks go into reverse. Then they become reluctant to create new money and lend it into the economy. And this, in turn, then contributes to a deflation of the prices. So house prices, which are already uh, falling, will fall even more, and the same for stock prices. So in this situation, the banks actually worsen the crisis that is already going on. So, in other words, banks have an incentive structure for creating money when we don't need it and holding back when the economy actually needs money. We can compare this a little bit to an umbrella shop which sells umbrellas when the sun is shining, but then when it starts raining, the shop closes. Second problem, inequality. As we all know, when we borrow money, we have to pay interests. And we can think of interest as a kind of tax on money. So we pay this tax to the banks in order to participate in the economy. This form of money tax, however, works opposite of normal taxes. Because if you're rich, if you already have money, if you already have assets, you can borrow more money at a very low interest rate. If you have little money, however, you have to pay a high interest rate. So you have to pay a high tax, so to speak. And of course, if you're poor and you have no money at all, then you can't borrow anything. So to my mind, the uh, way that money is created is a key explanation for not only for the inequality that we have in our uh, societies, but also for why this inequality just keeps rising and rising and rising. And this growing inequality applies to individuals, but it also applies to countries. So we see some countries paying a high interest rate and thereby becoming poorer and poorer, and we see other countries getting richer and richer. The third point has to do with power. So if you can decide when to create new money, if you can decide how much new money to create, if you can decide the price at which this uh, money is lent into the economy and for what purposes it is lent into the economy, then you have enormous power, not only over the economy, but over society as la at large. So by privatizing our money system, the creation of money, we have essentially handed over a very vital societal power to the financial sectors. I believe that's why many politicians today appear very impotent. It's because the crucial decisions, they're not made in parliament anyway. They're made in the boardroom of major private uh, banking corporations. So the way that money is created today explains instability. Why do we have all these crises all the time? Inequality and a concentration of power 
outside of democratic institutions. This may sound gloomy, perhaps because it is quite gloomy. The good news is, however, that there's a smart solution to this. Oops. Um, now, it may sound as if what we need is a revolution and an entirely new money system. However, I believe that much less can do because what we only need is an update of our existing system. Let's look at the paper money again. As I said before, this is created by the central bank. It has a monopoly on the creation of this kind of money. It decides when to create them, and it decides how much to create. And whatever profits from the creation of money goes to the government, who can then use them in the economy. It can lower taxes, it can increase social benefits, public investments, all kinds of good things. Uh, and this is indeed a good system. It's something that we all take for granted. We don't hear many, very many people say, oh yeah, let's, let's uh, have uh, private corporations make uh, uh, paper money. We don't hear that. No, it's a good system. It does, however, have one problem. It hasn't kept up with the technological development. So if we want to make electronic payments today, we can't use this kind of central bank money. We have to rely on the money that is created by the commercial banks. We have to go through the commercial banks' account and their payment system. So what we need to do, basically, in order to solve these problems, is to update the central bank's old monopoly on money creation so that it counts not just for paper money, but also for electronic money. So that rather than uh, commercial banks, um, uh, rather than uh, depending on the commercial banks for our electronic payments, we should all have an account with the central banks so that when we want to make electronic payments, we can simply uh, transfer money from our account in the central bank to someone else's account in the central bank. Now, where would this lead commercial banks? Would they be put out of business? By no means, because their role would be what banks have done for centuries and what they're actually, or what they used to be good at, which is good old classical banking. They would take deposits of existing money and lend it to people who want to uh, invest or spend or whatever they want to do with the money. So they should, they should um, be sort of a, a link between people who wanted to uh, save up and, and, and people who want to uh, borrow. Uh, they, they sh what they shouldn't do, however, is create new money. So this system is called a sovereign money system because now the creation of money would be the monopoly of the sovereign state. So in the beginning, I asked you to reconsider money. And I want you to do this not just as a philosophical exercise, but also as a political reflection. So when was the last time you heard two politicians debating whether private corporations or the state should create all the money that we all have to pay, uh, depend on for our daily expenditures, to pay bills, to pay our taxes, and so forth? Never. Never. Because money creation and money reform they are, not issue, they are not part of the mainstream political agenda. No, this, these issues, they are reserved for technocrats in central banks at best and CEOs of private banks at worst. So ordinary people have no business interfering in these matters. So what I hope that you will take away from this talk are two things. One, I hope you will take away the confidence that you can understand and form a qualified opinion about money and money creation. And secondly, I want you to feel that you have a democratic right to at least be part of the, system, uh, of the decision of who should create our money in the future. Thank you.